have for all today. Today we're going to talk about uh, spot media. Uh, actually, first of all, can everybody hear me just fine? Different little louder. Little louder. Little louder. Okay. Is that all? Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, apologize if it's. Uh, let me know if there's any problem hearing me or anything like that. It's hard to see. Right? Uh, I can't control the weather, but uh, fortunately, I guess it's sunny today. So, uh, moving on. Let's see. So everybody's asking, what is this? What's this company? Uh, this is the official pronunciation of Owl, uh, and this is our, you know, our, uh, our sign. So. One thing I want to do actually is just do a quick introduction of what this company is. So, Package. 
There's also a lot of development in the different part of the area, like Spark SQL, DataFrame, all really new. Uh, lots of interesting development in MLLib, for example. There's still a lot of potential in this stack. Uh, one thing I want to start off with for this presentation is this little tweet. Uh, basically, I don't know, I, necess I would necessarily agree with the 80 20 kind of split, but essentially, we spend a lot of time in this job looking at data and, and looking at cleaning out, you know, make sure we have the right data set. Uh, and I think this is relevant to what the topic of this uh, talk today, which is we're going to look at different ways to look at the data, looking at different ways of kind of visualizing it so that we know the, you know, we have the right data or we have the right method of actually looking at data itself. So uh, to start with, I want to talk about wrap. Uh, this is read, eval, uh, print loop. Um, so can I have a quick show of hand? How many of you actually use it, uh, any one of these on the screen right now? Wow. That's a lot. So can I do a quick show of hand of who's using Spot Shell? Oh, it's not a lot as I thought. Uh, PySpot? Nope. Okay. Uh, so, so I guess it's kind of all spread out then, you know, given the, the mix of all these different ones. But what I'm trying to achieve here is to give you kind of an, an idea of just within Spark, how many different flavors of these would all kind of tie in. It's all like, you know, command shell and grapple, and you can actually use it to kind of interact with Spark and use Spark to uh, process data. Uh, R obviously wasn't really quite the topic for today, but you know, R is definitely part of there, and especially with this latest development with Spark R that uh, I think is integrated into Spark as of last week. So that just happened, and so there's a lot of exciting development there. Uh, I, have, I have one interesting, other interesting question. Does anybody know anything about Hive console? Oh, you do? Okay, great. Uh, maybe you should get a raffle ticket. But anyway, so, <laughs> uh, so Hive Console is just uh, a special version of um, Spark SQL Console that actually have the Hive Context plugin so you can talk to, like, connect it to uh, a Hive server. Uh, so. There's actually a lot of these. So this hopefully will give you a sense of kind of what, what we have in a Spark shell. So if you run Spark shell, you get a little visual view of other things. But what you do in here is you write some code, uh, and then you write some more code, and then instantaneously you get sort of the feedback of kind of like uh, what 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 is the result of that analysis, right? Like well, in this case, I'm just printing a number, but that's kind of like. Um, so what's good about it is you can see you know. Uh, your code and the result from your code immediately. Basically, you run it and it's like, okay, it's working or it's not working? Or maybe I don't have the right data type or, or something, right? So you can get it the right way. What I'm also good about it is uh, it's only okay as IDE, meaning that you really don't want to be, as an engineer or, or data scientist, just kind of spend all your time in a command shell and just kind of like, you end up like having to do a lot of looking up. Uh, and then uh, the other thing here is when you type the code, there isn't anything to save the, what you type in. So every time you restart, you get disconnected or something, you have to kind of put it in the code again, or you copy paste back in. Uh, or you don't really have a way of rerunning it. You can actually go up and, and rerun a particular line of code, but it's, it's kind of not really quite there. And then the worst part here is you don't really have any way of kind of visualizing. So in the previous case, I've got a bunch of numbers, right? Uh, you know, like maybe it's useful to actually have a bar chart. Right? So, but you don't really have a way of doing that. So that leads me up to a uh, notebook. So what is a notebook? Uh, I hope everybody has a notebook now. Uh, you know, a little Apple notebook. Uh, but it's not really that notebook. What, I, what, I, what we're talking about here is um, a couple of things. First of all, uh, IPython is one of the more mature uh, notebook that's out there. IPython notebook specifically. IPython is actually a mixture of everything, uh, a lot of different things together. So, um, IPython notebook has, it's one of the more mature uh, system in, in right now, and we're going to start talking about this uh, right now. So, I'm going to switch to, I'm going to switch to, uh, my watch is uh, annoying here, but I'm going to switch to this demo I'm going to start right now. So, what I have right here is, uh, 
uh, let's see, I'm going to have to connect to this. So as I as I said, I'm going to connect to. Yeah, I'm going to. So I'm going to connect to the system we have in the cluster here in Apple. Uh, it's a little hard to see, but I, it's not really intended for you to kind of see on the screen that I'm going to have to do on the screen. So just bear with me for a second, and I'll have the notebook up in in no time. So what I'm going to do here is run the script that I have that uh, set up uh, everything and then start the notebook. So what I'm going to do here is to go ahead and open up the notebook with this URL. I don't know why it's keep opening the, the video. I guess we want to watch that video again. So type in a password. Uh, let me make that a little bigger. Uh, is it? Is it okay? People in the back can see? And, uh, yeah. No? They are not. Uh, they they okay. Hey. Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the maximum. Alright, so we can scroll down here. I've got a bunch of stuff going around. Let's open up some notebook uh, for now. So here's kind of the main iPad on notebook interface. Uh, this one is actually the 2.0 version, we'll get back to that in a bit. You know, there's actually multiple versions that we have. In fact, there's like 2.0, 3.0, 3.x, and 4.x that's being developed right now. Uh, but I just want to give you a sense quickly kind of what this is about. So you have this line in the box. Uh, this is actually Python code. So what you can do is you click on this thing, which uh, would actually run this line. And what this is doing right now is actually dial this, this uh, image and show it as a result, right? And then there's other things you can do. Uh, so let me just go ahead and run the two of these. So here's IPython and there's Jupyter. So Jupyter is actually the uh, replacement or successor for IPython. And we're really renaming everything to Jupyter. The idea here is Jupyter is going to be the language agnostic version of IPython. We support like different type of languages. Uh, Python, Scala, R, that sort of stuff. We'll, we'll touch on that in a bit. But, um, you know, that's kind of the name, and we'll get to actually look at that a little, little more in a bit. Uh, but we'll stick with IPython for now. So, what is IPython? Um, do I need to make it a little bigger and kind of hope it helps? I don't think that's going to do it. Alright, switching back here. Let's see if I can be mean. Let's see. There you go. Does that help? Yeah. Okay, I don't want to do that because I can't execute anything. Uh, so, IPython, uh, what is IPython? IPython is a collection of uh, a bunch of these things. So, there's an interaction shell, meaning you actually run it like a REPL, you actually run it on the command line. Uh, and then there's a browser grade no uh, notebook, which is this. Uh, and then there's a bunch of kernel, and we can talk about a kernel in a bit. And then uh, it has great support for visualization. Uh, one, of the, one of the most popular libraries called Matplotlib on Python. And IPython itself is built on top of uh, CRFQ and a bunch of other uh, Python uh, packages. So IPython notebook, and here's why I talk about REPL to begin with. IPython notebook is actually, in a way, a browser-based version of REPL. Uh, so what it is is, you know, give you an environment, you know, from the, the toolbar, from the editor, and all those stuff. So you actually run your code in, and it will actually save the output and input and all your code inside a JSON document. Uh, that's where the Python notebook uh, is actually stored. Uh, the other thing we want to talk about before kind of moving a little bit ahead is uh, Matplotlib is one of the more popular library. Uh, and the goal here is to give you really easy access API that's similar to the MATLAB API that uh, what you can see in the bottom here, you can define the graph, you can add the label, you can add title, and you can show it pretty easily. Uh, that's really, uh, really easy to use from, from the Python, uh, Python code. Last bit before we move on is PySpark. What is PySpark? PySpark is Spark on Python. Uh, so this, in this case, when you're working with IPython, it's actually running as a kernel. And each notebook you open, it actually spin up a new copy of the uh, PySpark in the background to process your code. And to support this part of the demo, we have 
the color uh, five five three cluster Spark, Pi Spark running in Yarn Client mode, and a bunch of other packages we have on Python side. So one other thing you can do is something like this, where uh, you can actually take a look at the original markup, where you can write all these kind of really confusing things. But what's kind of nice about it is you can have it render into this nice mathematical formula as part of your analysis. You can say, hey, here's what you know the analysis is trying to do. The other thing also uh, is useful is if you are more uh, about writing code, you know, you can also uh, embed your your code description inside the Python. Do you yes. write the math that way, or do you have to write it in the markup? Oh, uh, so this is more for presentation, basically. So let's just say you're writing a notebook in a way that you want to collaborate with somebody else. Uh, the idea here is this is all fully interactive, right? So you can actually save. So one thing we really nice about IPython is that you can actually save the output as actually a web page and share it with everybody. So you can say, describe kind of what you're doing, you know, the mathematical formula behind everything you do, and the result that you see and just all included into either uh, PDF or uh, HTML, and you can just post it online and everybody can see it. You can also leave it kind of like uh, interactive like this. There are hosts, uh, hosting, uh, hosting uh, co or company that actually hosts Python notebook as well. So you can actually have upload the Python, uh, IPython notebook as is, and people can actually run execute stuff on there. Obviously, you know you need to have the right data that's already included uploaded as well. So that's kind of give you a rough idea of what it is, but let's go ahead and execute some Python code. Uh, in this case, I'm trying to see if Manpodlib is actually installed. It is great. So let's move on to Spark. Uh, this is checking what version of Spark we have in place, right? So 2.79, it's 2.79 for Python, and then uh, 1.2 for Pi for Spark. Uh, so let's actually write some Spark code. So what I have here, it, it should be. Hopefully easy to see, but basically this is doing a word count, one of the kind of most frequently used uh, example in, in Spark world. Uh, is how easy it is to actually spit up the line and just kind of do the count. Uh, this is in Python, and but I already have the sample input here actually just just to uh, for simplicity. So I can run this. It will run. So the star here indicates it's actually running the code, right? And in a bit you're going to see the output, which is what you see out in here. Right? What it does is actually breaking up all the words individually and counting something up there. Yeah. But the idea here is you can run all these, you can actually see the result immediately. Like if there's a bug in the code, you're not aggregating things correctly, or it could be something like, oh, I didn't spit up the white space or something, which is kind of one of the common problems here, is that you're looking at data and you don't know if I'm doing it right, or do I clean it up properly or something like that. So you can see the feedback. Uh, another problem, another uh, example here, uh, and we're gonna. By the way, we're gonna have a lot of these. So uh, one other example here is I have this page count uh, data set that I posted on the cluster. It's actually in HTFS. So what I'm gonna do is actually just kind of give you a, a, a few of what's in the data set itself. So there's like there's some date and there's like the the page name and everything. Uh, so I'm gonna do this more elaborate thing where it's actually. What is it trying to do? It's actually try, trying to map the pages into the account itself uh, and try to do a filter on making sure the account is greater than the, this number we have. So, and as you can see, you can actually see the result immediately. Uh, so that's one of the good things about Python you know, as an introduction of like, you know, what are the things you can do uh, just by running the Spark code you have. Now, uh, moving on to the next part, what I have here, here is uh, Shakespeare's uh, Hamlet uh, original text. And I'm going to do is, I'm actually loading, again, loading this on XFS, right? So I'm using Spark to say text file, read the file, right? I'm just going to give you a sense of the data we, we have in this file. But uh, in fact, that's the first few lines, I guess. Uh, but moving on, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to do uh, some processing on the data set. I'm going to split this up, right? And I'm going to go do a filtering, do some filtering on this. Right, making sure the words are greater than two characters. Right? I'm going to figure out all this empty space that I have. Again, it's like factoring into the whole data processing and cleaning that you need to do. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is 
I'm going to actually attempt to do the word cap here again, right? So what I'm doing is mapping the word into a, a value, and I'm going to do a reduce by key, which actually add all those values together and give me a cap on all those things. Apparently, there's a lot of all in the uh, Hamlet. Uh, and then I'm going to do a sort, right? That's also only a subset. Well, so now we get a point where we get a bunch of data, and, and to be honest, I'm only looking at 20 of these, right? There's a lot more in there. So there's got to be a better way of looking at this, right? We're going to be right there at, you know, in a one second. So now what we have is I have Matplotlib running here, and I'm going to actually plot the result of what I'm getting back from the uh, Python code or the Spark code. So, all right, let's take it a little longer than, than I thought it should be. Uh, it's the next one. What was that? It's done. It's done. It doesn't plot anything. It's the next one. Yeah. Oh, that's you're right. You're better than I do. So that's actually intentional. Uh, so I'm going to show you how easy it is to actually define a function that could be reused, right? So what you do is you define a function. You actually it's not doing anything. So excellent point for whoever actually point out what I'm doing here. Where's my cursor? It's a little hard to see from my side. Did anybody see my cursor? There you go, coming up. All right, so I'm, now we're running this line. So what I'm going to do is take a sample of the result we were looking at. Remember all these really kind of hard to read, you know, all the number we have? And I'm actually having this in a bar chart, basically. Like, there's more dirt in there. You, uh, I guess there's a lot of kings in the thing. Uh, ham is apparently a frequent, frequently used word in Hamlet. Uh, so you never know, huh? So, but that's one way of actually looking at the data to see whether things are making sense or not. So moving on, uh, the next sample here is uh, word vector. Uh, this is actually one of the uh, recent kind of uh, moment in the space where we want to look at analysis on uh, uh, documentation and, and text, and this is actually language, natural language, natural language processing, uh, in the sense that we want to actually try to uh, predict the related words given a particular single word. So uh, this has shown to be actually pretty useful for things like if you want to say, you know, how Paris, France is related to Rome and King, it, was, it would be able to actually figure that out. So here's the example here is what we have is a Wikipedia dump, a dump of the Wikipedia text. Uh, in this case, I have to do a little bit of processing to strip out all the lines, break it up into the individual lines, and also um, randomly sample to 200,000 lines. Uh, if it's much longer than that, it's going to take forever for today, so I don't think that's going to work. So uh, moving on, here's my cursor again. I'm going to execute this code. This is, in fact, that's going to take a while, so uh, this is, in fact, one of the uh, features in MLLib and Spark in that all you need to do is actually go pass this file that I've actually already pre-processed a little bit to make it kind of conform to the, to the, to the structure it's looking for. Uh, I need to do some kind of uh, breaking apart, cleaning the data so you can see the individual words, and then just run this into this. So this is actually running this, this uh, model in the back end on the cluster itself, and let's see if I can actually bring this up um, right here. So it's actually running on the cluster itself. Uh, this, this turns out word to wag is actually a pretty CPU intensive process. So it's actually doing some process after shuffling all the data around. Again, it's not really, really easy to see, but just to give you an idea that this is actually running on the cluster itself, uh, running multiple workers here. So we're going to have, we're going to see the result pretty soon. Again, this takes a little while. So moving on to the next spot first, actually. We'll come back in there. So after you create a model on the data set you have for all the text, the next thing you do is you can call the simple method on the model itself. And then you can then uh, identify the synonym, basically. So for example, you're given a, car, given a word car, it, it would give you basically what it thinks is similar to what you describe, uh, what, you, what you have in that, that product. Okay, so I think we should be good. Yes, so it's completed. So in this case, what you can see here is um, we can run this, and this actually turned out to be really good given the 
the subset of the subset of data I have in this case, right? So given car, you're going to get driver, train, uh, a couple other things, which is kind of odd. There's manager in there somehow. You get cars, motor, running. Uh, it, I think it's pretty good in a sense, right? And what you see on the right-hand side is actually the ranking, the, the score. So, but it's kind of hard to read still, right? Because it's like a bunch of numbers, and, you know, kind of, I don't know, I don't understand what it is. So I'm going to attempt to do this part again, but as you can see, it's not really that useful because this is like a lot of bars and all that stuff. I can see driver at the end of it, which tells me driver is one of the kind of more, uh, a word that's kind of more closely aligned with the, the word car I have. Uh, but what if we can do something different? Let, let me just go ahead and run this, and we'll come back in a bit. So what I have here is actually taking the content we have, and there you go. Uh, and visualizing it using the word count package. Uh, and then as you can see, uh, in basically this is uh, this is the word cloud I have, and this, in this case, you can see clearly player and driver is one of the top words that's closely correlated to cars. So I'm actually going to ask one of you to tell me, suggest a word that I'm going to go actually run it. Just, just make sure this is a real code that we're running. Uh, anybody want to suggest any, any word? Apache. Apache. Okay, we'll see. See how many Apache things we have on Wikipedia. Okay, I'm gonna run that again. So here's here's interesting thing about this is, uh, oh, interesting. But as you can see, I can just go back and go forward and can rerun things, and it's not coming in any particular order. I think that's kind of a step up uh, from you know the command shell. So in this case, let's see what I just did. So this is all the synonyms. Relate uh, uh, that's uh, cross spot to Apache. I don't know if that kind of make a whole lot of sense. Maybe it was kind of what it was looking. Helicopter. Maybe Yeah, I guess it's that Apache helicopter that's more <laughs> popular in Wikipedia. Crash the way up there. Crash the way up there. Oh, crash. Yeah, maybe it's, there's a news or something. So, but let's go back and so I can go, jump forward again and say, okay, I'm just going to go rerun this again and give me another word cloud uh, with Apache, right? So, oh, okay, so take a look at this. So we get MIL, which sort of makes sense. Hassan, I don't know, anybody knows anything about Apache with Hassan Harbor? Anyway, so that's kind of the idea. So you can just kind of see the number and you kind of really kind of get a better feeling of things are really working or not working, right? Because is that really a good, uh, you know, way to actually look at synonyms? If you would say I want to do grouping on the content or things like that, right? So you can actually play around with it. That's kind of idea. So uh, and then we're probably going to go on and talk more a little bit about kind of the collaboration aspect of this. So uh, as you can see here, uh, you can actually share this link, you know, with somebody else, assuming the server is accessible. Uh, you can have people working on this together. Uh, the other thing I want to do is actually I need that header back so I can navigate back to this. Um, leave this page. Uh, and then there's like uh, other things you can see from here, which is you know how it's running. Uh, it's not entirely accurate here. I don't think it's actually stopped, but anyway, so moving on. There's a bunch of oh, this one is running, so yeah. So this shows you that the, the, the notebook is actually running. And then you can go back to the notebook page. You can open a uh, create a new notebook. We'll go back to the, the, this interface a little bit. So what I'm going to do here right now is switch to. Is it using the smart scheduler or uh, the Is um, It's actually, in this case, it's using Yarn. So what I have is uh, PySpar running in the Yarn cluster running on a Yarn client mode, sorry. So it, it gets a little more complicated. Um, in fact, I think we're going to go back and um, maybe just quickly touch on it a little bit. Basically what I have here is IPython uh, web frontend talking to IPython server that actually launched uh, Python as a uh, kernel that runs PySpark. And PySpark in turn talk to the cluster because remember we're running this in the, in the cluster itself. 
And then running on the cluster uh, through the yarn scheduler, because I'm running um, PySpark in the yarn client mode. So and then the work actually happens on the worker node running on uh, running on the cluster. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. It gets a little complicated, but it's, it's kind of you know it's, uh, it's multiple hops in the thing. So let's go on and okay, I'm losing track of my cursor again. All right, there you go. I'm going to minimize this so it doesn't get in the way. And then come back here, and I'm going to be, again, hang on with me for a second. I'm going to be running a few things right here. And it's going to be hard to see in the back, but again, I'm, what I'm doing is actually running, uh, launching the, the IPython uh, notebook. So in this case, I have, uh, like I mentioned, the uh, the Python and Spark hosted my Rayburn uh, local setup. So in this case, I have IPython running on that VM that runs on my notebook here. Oh, not notebook, laptop. I think it makes sense. So, okay, so what I'm gonna do is actually gonna go open up, that's not what I wanted to see. It's kind of hard to keep track of the problems. Should I make it bigger? Okay, so I have IPython here. And this is going to be a little tricky because Safari is kind of not very corresponding, but let me see if I can kind of make it bigger. Uh, does that help, I think? Yeah. Okay, great. So moving on here, I'm going to go open this up uh, below right here, which is, where is it? That's kind of weird. Oh, uh, okay. I think I'm almost good. Right. So, I need to go make it bigger again, unfortunately. But hopefully you can see. Uh, I actually want to, before I, I switch and talk a little bit more, more about uh, Python and Jupyter and all those other things, but I wanted to start with this little uh, diagram. Uh, so this is from one of my favorite plays. Uh, does anybody identify what this is? Or? XKCD. XKCD, there you go. So, um, and you're right, and you actually know exactly what, uh, what this, this particular one is. So this is the uh, Bomber Spike, I think? Yes. Bomber P. Bomber P, there you go. All right, so, okay, there you go. It's called Bomber P. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you read a little bit about that uh, before, before I start the last, next part. So, okay, moving on here. Either way, so let's go cracking. So what I have here is, uh, again, a different setup. IPython, Python 279, running on, uh, running on all nodes in the previous setup, right? And the other thing you need to do, and I'm happy to actually go through more of that in detail, is you need to set up all these things basically to get it to work properly. So um, a lot of these are basically setting up, you know, what is it, the Python driver uh, that should run on the driver. And there's a bunch of parameters for controlling like deployment mode like you were asking about. Like you can actually set it up to run locally as well. Unfortunately, I don't think PySpark actually support uh, yarn cluster mode. It only support yarn client mode. So, um, so there's a little limited option in terms of what you set. The other thing interesting is you need to remember to set the LD library path because otherwise L MapPublic will not actually run correctly. Uh, although it has actually improved quite a bit in the last few months. Uh, when I started, I have to set a lot more of these things up. Right now, it is almost like running um, Spark submit with these parameters, with these set, uh, sort of figure out the way, the way I approach it. Um, and then Jupyter, we talked about Jupyter being the next kind of forward looking release, and so right now we have a running Jupyter, which is uh, IPython slash Jupyter version 3, uh, 3x or running here. So there are a bunch of other kernels that actually could be integrated into this, and you switch kernel basically from going here, uh, well, actually going. If we go back to the original page, we'll go back in a, in a bit. But um, there's iGo, there's Bash, there's R, there's Husco, and this is not infrared, by the way. 
uh, this, this part is not infrared, and there's IMATLAB, and all the other things you can think of, and there's actually a bunch more. This is only a subset. So there's anything you can interact, integrate together in here. Um, so apparently I'm running a little over time, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. And what I'm going to do next is actually going to give you a sense of the visualization uh, and the rich ecosystem that, uh, that is available on top of Jupiter. So um, I'm going to make it a little bigger, but I'm not going to go through all the current detail uh, simply because it's just too many of this. But I want to give you an idea of like, say you can build this right little pretty uh, bar chart right away. And it's just to be clear, there's no chart here before. This is running your code. Uh, same goes here. And then you write this little, little diagram, which is great. And then the other thing here is you can do, uh, I think this might be stock of some kind, but I don't know what that is. Uh, and then you can do scatter port, uh, scatter chart, like 3D. One other thing that you can do here is uh, 3D scatter chart, right? So you see all the bubbles. We actually will get back to something like this in a bit, but uh, this is kind of a version of that you can do with MetPublic. Are you um, visualizing data frames right now? Um, not at this point, but I'm just kind of giving you kind of an idea of like all these things you can do. Uh, it's actually not very hard to do to to plug this in, right? To a spark like what we see, what we've seen before. So, and then now we're talking about KCD, and here's another one. This is actually potting. You know, this is not pen drawn or anything. Uh, and then, and then there's another one in like two and a half D, I guess. I don't know what that is. And then there's this, which actually there's an actual one coming next to KCD, but this side, this, this is from the code that I'm reading right now, that I have right now, right? And then you can see uh, claims on the supernatural power is, I don't know, refuted by experiment mostly. And here's another thing, which is an original, here's an original uh, image, right? So here's the one we just plotted right here in IPython. Here's the one that actually what it looks like. So I think that's pretty much it. Let's see. Um, there's more code. I don't know what this one is doing. Let's go ahead and run all these. Right, there's more of the XKCD ones. And then this is the original version. This is the one that actually generated in Python code right now. And this is the original. It's a little longer than I thought it would be. But the idea here is very simple to leverage the ecosystem we have. You get a data set, you just plug into this Python code, we use all the rich library there is, and do all these things. Uh, let's switch on. Uh, good, it's making sure I save the, the changes I have. So let's move on to the next one, and I promise you that's going to be uh, sort of the last resolution for a bit before we come back to this. Uh, because we're going to switch case to something a little different. Uh, but uh, I want to talk about a couple of different li library uh, packages that's available right now. So uh, we have Seaborn, which is a really high level interface that make it really, it builds on top of Matplotlib and makes it really easy to plug in PyData and uh, Limpy and Panda and so on. And also look really nice. So here's an example, again, it's just an example of what kind of code you can do in this case. Oh, I didn't write run this, so I'm going to go do this again. Okay, come back here, just to make sure I click on the thing. Uh, here's what we can see here is actually this is very nice. It's kind of hard to see from the the header bar, but this is a uh, correlation matrix, right? So you can see how all different variables are correlated together. Uh, this is keep heel keep helix palette, uh, and then. It's all running new code, there's no graph here, and then this is all annotated heat map. Um, that takes longer than I thought. Anyway, so there's another, there's another uh, package system, this is the last one. Uh, oh, there you go. So, as you can see, it's not restricted to just really simple line graph or bar chart. You can build really complex uh, visualization with the library, and you have it plugged into uh, you know, Spark as well. So, and then what I have here is the last one. This is the, uh, 
both, both key. Um, and what this is to trying to what this is trying to do here is um, simplify, provide a really simple interface uh, to give you really simple and similar uh, visualization. Oops, what just happened? Visualization like D3JS, and you can do HTML output. In fact, that's the default. Uh, uh, Server-based calling for streaming, and we're going to talk about another streaming uh, framework uh, in a bit. Uh, and you can do downtime calling and whatnot. So let's just run this. We're going to run this again. Uh, this is a really complex uh, correlation. It's kind of oh, I can't scroll <coughs> because I have this really large view. But this is collating all the different characters in the, in, the, in the show. So, and then you can go on and run the second thing. Oh, where is it? It's kind of hard to see with the big. Yeah, so there you go. This graph here. Oops. Make sure. Right? Time series port, right? And then you can go. This is. Another one with the bacteria, right? So, it's kind of the example here is the richness of the things you can build with this, right? And then you can also do a lot of things like saving the graph and you can resize it and things like that. And this is the one that I want to leave you with is there you go, if you're on the table. So, this is all coming from the code. Sorry? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Again, yeah, this is all code, right? So it's actually what you write. Um, so, okay, so this is kind of the last one. And we'll be back for a little bit more about IPython or uh, Jupyter in a bit. Right, and that's it. And then we're going to be back with us in a bit. So I'm going to close this. Yes. Really didn't like it, leave it off like that because when you save it, you actually save the rendering as well, so you have to share it later on, like I said, with everybody. So, let's see, I'm going to have this. Okay, right, back to the presentation. So, we're kind of moving on to uh, the next part. We talked about iPython for quite a bit longer than I thought it would be, but um, the next we're going to talk about Sapphire. So what is SAML? Um, so let me actually show you right away. I mean, I don't really like to do a lot of slide here, but I'm just going to go show it to, to you right away. And uh, give me a second here. And I'm going to go stop this thing. There you go. All right. So. Um, Okay, what I'm doing is actually sap, starting Sapling as a service uh, on my Vagrant cluster, like I said. And I'm actually going to run this, it's Google, but here's Sapling. This is a nice uh, Sapling interface. Uh, this is sort of the front page, uh, hopefully you can see. I can go here. I don't know why I never really stick around so much, but okay. So here's your notebook. So uh, we're going to talk about what is happening in a little bit, but I want to kind of walk through basically. Uh, so in this case, you can do markup in Sapling. There's actually pretty rich markup support in Sapling here. As you can see, uh, what it does sort of right now is I actually have uh, Spark as the back end supporting this, but you can do a lot of things. So, so you can see here, all I do is actually write in some markup, it gets converts into a diagram like this. So it actually helps to visualize if you have like a visual, like a sequence diagram, you want to see, hey, this is what my program is doing, uh, explain it inside while you have other code. The other thing you can also do is uh, you can write a bunch of code and have it uh, code block and markup and have it kind of created with the syntax highlighting and you know so you can actually illustrate the code that you have along with the actual code itself that's actually running as well. So one of the nif nifty feature with 
uh, supplement is that you actually have something called a dynamic form that they have. So there's like a box, so you actually have it inside your notebook, uh, your notebook itself. So, and this show up in here, uh, you know, in the text. So you can actually do it uh, as a mixture of the code or the mockup that you have. So we could say Spark Meetup, whoops. Right, so that show up here right away. So we'll see how useful it is in a bit. But before we do that, let's try to load some library. So what this is doing here is there is a interpreter. Uh, we'll get back to terminology in a bit. But basically, what it's trying to do is help facilitate packages that you want to download. This is like something was not registered correctly. Oh, there you go. And here's why. I don't know why it wasn't saved. I guess I have a typo here. Um, there you go. It gets loaded correctly. So we'll get back to that in a bit. And the other thing you can do is with mockup, you can actually write HTML as well, right? And then you can actually write. Um, I don't know. That seems to be going a little longer than that probably. All right. Yeah. So you can actually write mockup. And then you get this nice little diagram that you can easily just write in a single line. Uh, we'll get back to that in a bit. And then, remember the library that I brought down? Uh, so what you can do is you can actually write a, shell, write a shell script right inside the notebook itself. So if I run this, right, what it does is exit an error. Um, let's see. We've got this data. I don't think that's going to work. All right, so moving on here. But the goal here is, remember the library we brought down? We can actually bring down the data set and have it actually executing Scala code right here and talking to the library and 